Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. I want to welcome you to Delaware Valley University's One Health Seminar Series. This is the first uh, One Health event of 2020, so we're excited by that, and we're, we're excited that we have such a wonderful panel of guests that are joining us today. For those of you who are attending one of our um, events for the first time on One Health, um, it's important for you to know that One Health is a transdisciplinary, holistic approach to really thinking about well-being of people, well-being of our community, plants, the environment, natural systems, um, kind of the whole gamut. We here at Delaware Valley University work really hard to ensure that we provide education on One Health, research, and outreach to the community. It's a very collaborative approach to a number of faculty, um, across the disciplines, across our schools are involved in our One Health initiative. And just for your information, November 3rd is World One Health Day. Um, and here at the university, we're, we're, we're gonna do an inaugural one, DelVal One Health Week and we have a number of events associated with that. Or we had a number of events associated with that. Um, and the US Congress has, has deemed January One Health Awareness Month. So it's very appropriate that we are starting, um, well, in, in February, but. Um, so tonight's presentation is titled PFAS in Pennsylvania, How Forever Chemicals Threaten Our Health and Environment and What We Can Do About It. Um, it includes, as I said, a very impressive panel of guests, and it is a real honor, honor for me to introduce to you and welcome back to our campus, Senator Maria Collette. She was here in November. She represents the 12th Senatorial District across parts of Bucks and Montgomery counties. This area includes communities that have some of the highest levels of PFAS contamination in the country. country. Senator Collette is committed to making sure Pennsylvanians have clean, safe drinking water and access to quality, affordable health care. Senator Collette will be joined by Joanne Stanton and Hope Gross, who are both co-founders of Bucksmont Coalition for Safer Water and serve on the National PFAS Contamination Coalition. Dr. Sharon Watkins is the PA Department of Health Director for the Bureau of Epidemiology and State Epidemiologist. And Kyle Bagenstos is an investigative reporter with the USA Today Network. And he was previously an environmental reporter with the Bucks County Courier Times and Intelligencer, where, he's, where he spearheaded Unwell Water, an award-winning series on PFAS con contamination in the region. So please join me in welcoming our panel. And before I go, I just want to quickly highlight that after 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 um, this event, there is there is a list of all of our One Health seminar series here that you can grab. And if you want to be part of our email list, you can sign up down here as well. So thank you. I actually hate this house. I just feel dirty when I'm here. We grew up outside. We grew up playing in this grass and in the woods. You grow up thinking you're in this safe environment, in this safe home, and living this perfect life. And then you get to 25 and you find out you were poisoned. completely oblivious to everything. Um, it probably wasn't until the Warminster Naval Air Base became uh, a Superfund site. That was the first time I realized that the water could be in jeopardy. We were offered uh, water testing, which we had done several times. And we were told, although the chemicals were there in the water, they weren't at a level to be concerned. A few days after the last test, they said, stop drinking the water immediately. Warminster is lovely. It's such a nice 
feeling towns. There are these, you know, leafy streets you can walk down. It's really sort of idyllic. It's also, unfortunately, deeply polluted. And I think how polluted it is is only coming into focus now that people have been exposed for their whole lives. So people who are in their 40s and 50s now are realizing that these lovely childhoods they had, you know, playing in outside and in their friends' houses and sometimes on the military base that, that you know, is just across the street from their homes, that it left them exposed and, and vulnerable and sometimes sick. When after I had had my third son, uh, we found out that my oldest child, Patrick, who was six years old at the time, just getting ready to enter first grade. He was having migraines for the last few years, but they were getting more intense. He was having nauseousness, vomiting in the morning, and then having a problem with his balance. And um, we took him to the doctors, and the MRI revealed a brain tumor. The doctors came in our room, and they started pummeling us with questions. Where do you live? Where did you grow up? Do you ever work with pesticides? Do you live near a farm? Do you live under high tension wires? And these are questions that I never would have even thought about. And I was looking into what would cause kidney cancer because it didn't, it didn't run in my family. I don't have any history of it. Don't have any history of multiple sclerosis in my family. So I looked into it and found an article about the chemical, uh, the PFOA and PFOS that was in, um, fire retardant foam that's used at air bases. We were less than a half a mile away from the air base. This is um, where they burnt the fires, the firefighting foams. It was a um, drill site. We would come when we'd hear the sirens and run over to the fence and they'd be putting all the fires out. Um, they did this a couple times a week, maybe three times a week, and it just was our entertainment. When it really hit home and things really started to fall into place where I just instinctively felt it really did was when a neighbor a few doors down who also grew up on my street had a son who had a brain tumor. And I thought, wow, that's odd. You know, pediatric brain tumors are rare. So for two of us on the same street to have a child with a brain tumor, you know, this is not normal. A lot of people have moved out, but some are still here. I have another friend who's, she died, Patty, of a, a brain tumor, but it started out as melanoma, cancer, cancer. Um, so many of them. This is my house that I grew up in right here. Right there. Um, this is my friend Brendan's house across the street. Uh, he also has his child with a brain tumor. He suffered great great many losses to cancer, uh, his mother, his father, his brother. Military bases tend to be very, very polluted. The chemicals there, you see uh, pesticides, you see solvents, you know, PCBs. I knew about heavy metals. I knew about the mercury and the lead and the heck of chromium. We were exposed to PFAS, but we were exposed to a heck of a lot more. We haven't caught up with looking at singular chemicals and what the health effects of these are. We are far away from ever being able to study, if we even can, how these all combine and what the health effects could potentially be. I've, since 25, struggled with um, cancer diagnosis and testing and autoimmune disease and other tumors. I feel like I'm in remission. What does remission mean? It means that I'm not actively fighting cancer, but in my mind, I fight cancer every day always in the back of my mind. There are hundreds of military bases where firefighting foam has been used. These chemicals have leached out into the waterways um, and eventually into the oceans. Uh, they're in all sorts of wildlife and people all over the world. And we're now realizing that they have a whole range of health effects. In terms of a cleanup, it feels too slow and too late. And I think especially to the people who are living with it. Hi, 
everybody. Can you hear me okay? Good. So um, what a powerful way to introduce tonight's topic. As you heard, we'll be talking this evening about PFAS in Pennsylvania, how forever chemicals threaten our health and environment, and what we can do about it. For those of you that don't know me, I am State Senator Maria Collette. I represent the 12th Senatorial District, and that includes the townships of Horsham, Warminster, and Warrington. Uh, and you'll hear a lot more about those communities later. They have been at the center of Pennsylvania's PFAS issues. And I am very lucky to be joined here this evening by uh, Bucksmont Coalition for Safer Water founders and grassroots activists, Joanne Stanton and Hope Gross. They were featured in the video that we just watched. This is Joanne's book. We'll talk more about this later as well. Uh, journalist Kyle Bagenstos is to my right. He's an investigative reporter for the USA Today Network. Previously, as you heard, Kyle worked for the Bucks County Courier Times and Intelligencer, where his years-long series, Unwell Water, has become the definitive account of the crisis in my district and its handling at the local, state, and federal levels. And to my left, I am honored to be joined by Mark Cooker, uh, who is an attorney who has been on the front lines of fighting the legal battles that are related to PFAS contamination in our Commonwealth. And unfortunately, uh, you see Dr. Sharon Watkins' uh, picture back there. She's of the State Department of Health. She's unable to join us this evening. She was needed in Harrisburg uh, because she's in charge of Pennsylvania's efforts to monitor and control the coronavirus situation. So we're certainly glad that she's there working on that, and we're really fortunate to have uh, these wonderful panelists joining us here this evening. So before I turn things over to our panel, I wanted to give a brief background about the development and the past uses of PFAS, or forever chemicals as they are sometimes known. PFAS is the plural term for about 3,000 per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. The first of these chemicals was discovered by DuPont scientists in the 1930s. And in the following decades, these chemicals, thought at the time to be miracle materials because of their ability to withstand extreme temperatures and their resistance to water, grease, corrosive chemicals, and even UV rays, were used in items like cookware, uh, Teflon, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Teflon cookware, uh, carpeting, rain gear, They've been in food wrappers, uh, even some of our personal care products like mascaras and sunscreens uh, can even contain PFAS chemicals. So uh, I mentioned Teflon there, if any of you have ever heard of the term uh, Teflon Don or uh, Tough as Teflon. The mob boss, John Gotti, he did get that nickname as the Teflon Don because he was able to elude cops and avoid prison for so many years, so like nothing stuck to him, just like Teflon. Uh, we know that PFAS are strong compounds, and some PFAS are stronger than others. The more carbons they contain, and for the chemistry majors out there, forgive me, I'm going to give a really brief version of this, but I'm sure many of you could tell us better. The more carbons that these chemicals contain, the longer their chain. And the longer their chain, the stronger they are and the longer it takes for them to break down, and that's in our environment and in our bloodstreams as well. So two of the strongest uh, of these chemicals are PFOA, P-F-O-A, and PFOS, P-F-O-S. And these happen to be the ones used in high concentrations in aqueous film firefighting foams, or AFFFs. These foams are the primary source of our local PFAS contamination. And for decades, local military bases and bases around the country, this is not just a Commonwealth problem, we're hearing more and more about PFAS around our nation, they've used these foams regularly and in massive quantities in their training exercises. Uh, I'm sure we're going to see some images here in the um, PowerPoint behind me where you'll see uh, just how much of that foam was used in some of those training exercises. It's really astounding. Um, to give you an example of the level of exposure that we're talking about, the EPA has issued a lifetime health advisory limit, so lifetime, keep that in the back of your mind, of 70 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS. And we'll talk a little bit later about why we think even that 70 parts per trillion is too high. But in 2014 and 15, public wells on and around the Warminster and Horsham bases were testing as high as the hundreds of thousands of parts per trillion. 
So remember, 70 parts per trillion was that health advisory limit, and some of this water was testing at hundreds of thousands of parts per trillion. And if you compare that to ongoing sampling of public wells across our commonwealth, where of 96 wells tested so far, only one tested above 70 parts per trillion, and about two-thirds uh, were tested at non-detectable amounts. So when we talk about the level of contamination in our local area, we are talking about a significant contamination. So now that our audience knows a little bit more about these chemicals, I'm going to start by turning to our panelists and asking each of them to uh, give us a little bit about uh, the specifics of uh, how they got involved, what their um, background is in this, and what they've um, sort of found uh, through their work. And then we'll get uh, into what's going on locally and what some of the major health concerns are. So Kyle, if you wouldn't mind starting us off. Testing? OK, works. Um, so I started as environmental reporter with the Courier Times in October 2015. Until that point, I had no idea what PFAS was or really even understood chemicals. Um, Pretty quickly, this became 90% of what I was doing. Uh, in the first couple of months, a resident emailed me and tipped me that this situation was going on. Maybe there's different perspectives on stage, but uh, until that point, I don't think he, a lot of the issue had entered the public consciousness with some of the level of what was going on. There were some well closures, but um, one of the first things I did was I realized there was an EPA spreadsheet with testing data for these chemicals all over the country, and I think over 10,000 water supplies. And when I sorted that Excel file, Horsham, Warminster, and Warrington were in the top 10 of readings nationwide for the chemicals in drinking water, which was obviously quite striking and quite concerning. Um, as I continued to start to research, I quickly found a Facebook group. Uh, I have the name here, Ivy Lind Warminster Toxic Contamination, which at that time had several hundred members uh, many of whom believed that something around the old Warminster uh, naval base had made them sick. They weren't really sure what, but there were hundreds of people sharing stories and concerns. Uh, I then realized that there was a second group around the Willow Grove base, primarily veterans who had served at the base, which was active for about 15 years longer, I think, than the Warminster base was. So more recent people and personnel and, and people whose top of, it was top of mind and similar, similarly, hundreds of people were concerned that something at that base had uh, made them sick, uh, caused them to have illnesses. Many were having difficulty getting the military to recognize their condition. So once I saw those two things kind of together, that you had uh, nationally high amounts of chemicals that while there wasn't a complete verdict back on them yet, had been linked by some studies to cancers, to conditions like ulcerative colitis, and at the same time, you had these large community groups, or large commu uh, group communities on the online who were concerned that something made them sick. That told me that there was a story worth, um, worth digging into. So we published the first report that shared a lot of that information in February 16th. Um, I think it struck a chord, and that led into um, numerous investigative reports that we continued uh, up through this year. So that was my introduction and a brief overview of, of my work on the topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. Joanne? Hi. Um, I'm Joanne Stanton. Um, and I came to you know, learn about this issue in a, I guess a much different way. It was very personal. Um, after my son was diagnosed with a brain tumor, I began to investigate and then write a book about a whole list of environmental pollutants and the difficulties that parents, particularly mothers, face um, every day trying to limit their children's exposures to chemicals. And I know that I was very naive as a young mother. I thought that if a product was on a store shelf, it was tested, right? It had to be tested. It was safe. If water came out of my kitchen faucet, it had to be safe. I had no idea how weak our chemical regulations were. I had no idea of the stronghold that industry actually has on our political system. And as a result, unregulated chemicals like PFAS can then make their way into our clean water sources, make their way into our home, 
and make their way into our bodies. Um, I also was very surprised to learn that we only regulate and test for about 90 different contaminants in our water, which was surprising to me, right? With all these untested chemicals out there, we only have to look for 90 of them. So that's when, I guess, I, Hope and I actually went to grade school and high school together um, and hadn't seen each other in a while, and then we reconnected. Um, we teamed up initially both because we both felt that our personal experiences were possibly PFAS related. You know, we grew up drinking contaminated water since uh, 1970, so our whole childhood. Um, and initially, you know, I think we were worried about ourselves and we were questioning things on a very personal level um, and we were angry and then we realized that, you know, we can't change the past, right? We can only change the future. So we began to shift our priorities from personal to more community-based um, and we wanted to know, you know, how can we prevent this from happening to another town? Um, can we get answers for our community as far as health with health studies? Um, and focusing on these questions just kind of naturally jumped us from being just a concerned citizen like anybody would be to actually be community advocates and community leaders in this issue. Um, and together we are working every day to try to do everything we can to lobby for um, laws to be changed at the state level and the federal level so that our, we can regulate this class of chemicals and we can um, have a safer environment. We can get PFAS cleaned up um, from our environment. I'm Hope Gross. Um, thanks for joining the panel today, and thank you to Maria for inviting us. Um, as you saw in the video, I grew up directly across the street um, from the Warminster Navy base. I actually did climb the fence and played in the firefighting training center in the shell of the plane with um, my friends in the neighborhood. I was personally impacted, and that's why I'm here today to speak to you, um, as so many others have been impacted in my town of Warminster, Warwick, um, Horsham, it's, it's spreading quickly. Um, too many people have suffered at the hands of the Department of Defense, and I think they need to be held accountable. I thought it was important to be active and vocal about this issue. So along with Joanne, we formed the Bucksmont Coalition for Safer Water. I remain outspoken about the practices on the base and PFAS contamination. There are so many people that would rather see us keep quiet and turn a blind eye to this whole thing. And I don't understand how some can be more concerned about the values of their homes um, instead of the health of their families. In fact, it remains that the Department of Defense polluted our drinking water for decades and they knew how harmful this chemical was and covered it up. Our community today, I believe, is still in denial about the impacts of PFAS and impacts of the contaminated water and the other chemicals in our water. I feel that the majority of people in town still don't get it, and even after five years of Kyle's work, um, extensive work and media coverage, continues to be continually frustrating. And I'm grateful for evenings like this that we can raise awareness. It's, it's really important for us to continue these types of events. As a community activist and advocate, um, I will continue to talk about these, the problem and I will continue to raise important questions and fight for change so that what happened to us doesn't happen um, to any other towns out there. So thank you again. Um, we teach our children at a young age to clean up their messes and um, the Department of Defense has not followed through with that, unfortunately. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Joanne and Hope. Mark, if you would give us a brief introduction. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Cooker. Um, I live in Upper Dublin Township and in the summer of 2016, I learned I had PFAS in my drinking water at a significant level. What made me different from the other residents of Upper Dublin Township is that for over 30 years as a lawyer, I represent people who have 
drinking water contamination. So I knew a lot about the subject of drinking water contamination, and I knew, as Joanne indicated, only a tiny fraction of toxic chemicals are actually regulated. And um, I first heard about PFAS actually about two and a half years before that, but what resonated with me about this subject was I was involved in what became known as the Toms River Childhood Cancer Cluster. That cancer cluster was caused by an unregulated chemical. And that's when I learned um, firsthand that, as Joanne said, only 90 chemicals are routinely tested for and regulated. That doesn't mean your water is safe. There are many other chemicals that are not regulated that should be and people get in a false sense of security for thinking, this isn't regulated, it can't be that harmful. Well, right now we know that PFAS is extremely harmful, documented by scientific studies far and beyond what was ever done probably on any other chemical, yet the federal and state governments have failed to act and failed to regulate the chemical. You can ask yourself why that is. But one thing is clear, that cannot be allowed to continue and we need to yell and scream and do whatever we can to make sure they take the necessary action to protect the public from this and the, this harmful substance in drinking water. Thank you all so much for those introductions. Uh, I'm going to start, uh, Kyle, with you. And uh, I know that you've been covering this contamination at and around the local military bases since it was first discovered in 2014. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's been happening since then? So um, my personal assessment is that there's been a lot more progress made on drinking water than there has been on environmental cleanup. So going back to some of those standards we talked about earlier, Senator Collette mentioned the 70 part per billion EPA level for, for PFO, PFO and, and PFAS. Uh, some, probably some chemistry people here who know already, but a part per billion, I cooked this up yesterday, is. Uh, one drop of food coloring in 357 two-liter bottles of water. So that's what one part per billion is. So 70 part per billion, 70 times that. It doesn't sound like a lot, but the problem with these chemicals is they accumulate in the body over time. So even a small amount will build up, uh, target certain organs, and have certain health effects. So different standards, the EPA's got 70. New Jersey has its own drinking water standards, which combine to about 27. So a fraction of what the, the EPA's is. And then some health researchers will say just one part per, uh, I'm sorry, part per trillion, excuse me. One part per trillion, not part per billion. Uh, one part per trillion. So uh, health researchers, um, some call for just one, which is actually below the level of detection, which basically means nothing in your water they believe is safe. Um, the Horsham, Warminster, and Warrington Water Authorities decided to go essentially with that standard implementing a zero tolerance plan for the chemicals in their water, which they have implemented. Uh, I think that was based a lot on some of the evolving science going on and also, um, you know, concern that residents may have been exposed to this and had this build up in their bodies for, for decades. So those systems have implemented those plans. That leaves a lot of people out, private well owners who exist between anything below 70. Uh, they are out of luck with the military military has not agreed to pay for water sources below 70, so that leaves a lot of these towns on the hook uh, for water. You also have nearby communities, uh, Mark mentioned in Upper Dublin, that are, are on their own and aren't within the military's um, uh, footprint of response. They haven't taken responsibility for those wells. So, uh, but that's the fact that they're the main three impacted communities do have clean drinking water is looks very good compared to when you look at the environmental cleanup which essentially has been non-existent so these chemicals are very pervasive in the environment they stay in soil they stay in streams they stay in rivers they don't go anywhere they well they don't they don't um, degrade they do travel uh, distances and um, that is uh, continuing to be a major issue so um, what that means uh, is that there's potential other pathways that could still exist so um, some of our work in 2019 was actually specifically focused on this issue of a lack of environmental cleanup. Uh, there could be things that contaminated fish in waterways that people would fish, catch, and eat. Um, there may even be a situation where people have used this water to water their gardens or other agricultural operations over time. I don't believe there's been a lot of assessment on that. 
There's also concerns about um, when this is still in the environment, if it goes into, well, I guess we're going to get into agriculture a little bit later, so I'll save that for now. But uh, suffice to say that, to, in my assessment, there has been a, a pretty good deal of, of, um, of progress in the drinking water, but the environmental contamination is still more or less, I think, where it has been, with very few exceptions. Thank you very much, Kyle. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the uh, health effects since Dr. Watkins wasn't able to join us. But before I do that, Mark, I was hoping that you could help our audience to understand the difference between a health advisory level or a maximum contaminant level and why it's so important that we make that distinction. Yes, a health advisory level is just that. It's advisory, it's guidance, it's not mandatory, it's not enforceable. Um, Basically, they do it out of the goodness of their heart. A maximum contaminant level is an enforceable legal standard under the safe drinking water that they must follow or else they're breaking the law. Thank you. And that is an important distinction for us to make as we go forward talking about, uh, you know, what we've seen happen since we've started to study uh, PFAS around our area. So as I said, Dr. Watkins unfortunately wasn't able to be here to personally talk about what she and the Department of Health and the CDC have been working on, but I'm going to walk you through it. Um, to, uh, the best I can, but please, um, the panelists that are here with me, feel free to chime in and let me know if I'm missing anything or if there's something we need to talk about in uh, more, more detail. So the first thing that I want to reassure you all, all about is that not all exposures are equal in their risk to you. So skin exposure of a small concentration of a shorter chain chemical, so for example, those stain resistant carpets I was talking about earlier, do not pose the same level of risk as repeated ingestion of water contaminated with higher concentration of longer chain chemicals. Similarly, the amount of exposure you may get by eating a slice of pizza or a burger that was packaged in a PFAS treated box or wrapper is more limited. Even skin exposure to higher concentrations of longer chain chemicals, so um, for example, those of you from Warrington, Warminster, Horsham areas who may have bathed in this water before it was cleaned up, that's also thought to pose almost no risk to healthy adults. Again, we need to make a distinction here. When um, those of us, I was a nurse prior to coming to the legislature, and so when clinicians talk about these standards, we often talk about uh, how the effect it's going to have on the healthy adult. We know very well that a lot of drugs, chemicals, have different um, impacts on those people who are immunocompromised, uh, especially when we talk about infants, when we talk about aging people, we talk about people with pre-existing um, other conditions. So uh, that idea that there may be no risk to healthy adults is not one that we should just be dismissive of. We, we need to really think critically about what it means when we say uh, healthy adults in that context. One of the other things that you'll hear a lot about is the role played by the chemical manufacturers and whether they continue to sell products that they knew to be dangerous. The short answer is yes, they did. And we could talk about this subject, I know I could, for, for hours. Uh, it's the subject of the documentary The Devil We Know on Netflix. Uh, it's the subject of the Mark Ruffalo book Dark Waters and of this book Exposure that was written by Rob Balot. Uh, he is the attorney that took on DuPont and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that study as well. But if you're interested, I highly recommend uh, reading the book or watching either of those films. Uh, what you'll learn is that as a direct result of Mr. Balot's lawsuit, the CAC8 study was commissioned, uh, and nearly 70,000 people who lived near a DuPont plant in West Virginia volunteered to have their blood tested. To date, it is the most comprehensive study of the health effects of C8. C8 is PFOA. In 2013, when the results were finally published, a link was found between C8 exposure and a number of conditions, including high cholesterol, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, testicular cancer, kidney cancer, and pregnancy-induced hypertension. More recently, in 2018, Pennsylvania's Department of Health, led by Dr. Watkins, conducted a pilot study known as the PEAT study, and uh, that was of residents here in our area. Blood samples were taken from 235 current residents 
of Horsham, Warminster, and Warrington. And some of the biggest takeaways of this study are 75% of our residents had higher levels of PFOA, that's that C8, than the national average, 75% higher than the national average, and more than 80% had higher levels of PFOS. Our residents showed higher incidences of high cholesterol, endocrine disruptions, certain cancers, reproductive health issues, and growth-related conditions. Longer residency and past work on the military bases also correlated with higher levels. Additionally, I want to point out that a 2018 Italian study found a correlation between PFOA and PFOS levels and low sperm counts and testosterone levels, as well as reduced testicular volume and penile length. So we know that these forever chemicals are dangerous, but there's still a great deal of scientific work to be done to learn more so that healthcare professionals can better understand how to monitor and treat people presenting with PFAS levels. Um, one of the things that I talk about as a nurse is that testing blood and finding the PFAS levels in blood is really critical, and uh, it's something that the people who have grown up in this area really want to know. But I always wonder, what is the next step of that? What do we do once we find out what that level is? What does the level mean, and what can we do to help people once they know those levels in their blood? So one exciting study that's coming up is the CDC's multi-site health study, and that's going to test people in seven states, including people right here in Bucks and Montgomery counties. I uh, hope I know that you've worked closely with the researchers on this and on the corollary temple cancer study, and I just wanted to give you a minute here uh, to talk a bit about how, uh, what we can expect to learn from those studies and um, why they're so important. So one of the solutions and things that we are working with are these two health studies. Um, the first one that Senator Collette mentioned is the National Multi-Site Health Study. Um, we are working with the Pennsylvania Department of Health to recruit people for blood testing. Um, and it's very important, and I encourage you, if you do live in the areas um, that have been impacted, around both of the DOD sites to actually um, volunteer. We don't have a lot of details on it yet. I believe it's possible that um, by the summer we'll have a timeline. Um, it's taken longer than we expected. Um, originally, they thought that they were going to be drawing blood in January. Um, so we don't have exact information on it, but it's, it's so important for us all to have that baseline, and if you did drink the water, um, for your families to know the history and to know those levels. And it's also gonna help this national study, they're gonna combine all this information and they're going to um, be able to show you know, levels in, in blood and on a national scale, as well as our area. Um, as far as um, Buxman Coalition teamed up with Temple and Temple is doing a psychosocial effects of the local water contamination, and they are focus groups. They'll be about two hours long. They're trying to collect about 100 people to do that. Um, the flyers are out front with the phone number to call. They are giving um, a gift card for you to join. They're actually coming out to the local libraries in Warminster and Horsham to um, run those focus groups. There'll be no more than eight people in each group. Um, they're just trying to understand, you know, the effects that emotionally and anxiety and, you know, things that we might think about. We might be healthy today, but we might not tomorrow. So I think it's important for us to understand what's happening on all different levels. Um, Temple and Buxmont would love to build a foundation with both of these health studies and be able to take some of the information that we are gonna gain from this and do a health study of our own um, at some point. Thank you, thank you so much. So, absolutely. So just on the health effect topic, um, three things come to mind in my five years of covering these chemicals that uh, really hammer home to me the significance from a health impact standpoint. 
So uh, through documents that actually Mr. Kuker produced or, or was able to get through discovery through his um, legal efforts that I analyzed, we saw that um, in 2000, 3M, which was the primary supplier of firefighting foams to the military, was a very lucrative business, decided to put the brakes on it completely. Why did they do that? Because they realized these chemicals meet three key criteria, persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. They last a long time, they build up in human tissue or animal tissue, and they're toxic. So when they realized those three, those three things existed, they more or less put the brakes in the entire program, and that sent shock waves through the whole firefighting foam industry from people. So why would a major company stop a business unit like that? They obviously have to have a good amount of concern about what the health impacts can be. The second thing, and I'm not sure if it was mentioned yet tonight, uh, federal health testing, blood testing, has found that these chemicals are in upwards of 98, 95% of humans, which means that everybody in this room has a synthetic chemical running through their veins right now. And what that means in a long-term impact is still being studied, is still unknown. Exactly where the threshold is, how much of it causes an impact, we're not sure. The third thing that I think is among the most concerning is talking to some of these health researchers about the potential health impacts of these chemicals that are in all of our blood, is that they believe that population-wide health impacts already may be occurring. So two things uh, that stick out is your cholesterol level, um, so that these chemicals have been shown to be linked to increased cholesterol. So obviously that becomes a threshold standpoint. Even if it's a minimal effect, someone who would be right below a, th a threshold of health concern is now above that threshold. The second one, and I think there's still a decent amount of research being done to understand exactly what this effect might be and to make sure that it does exist as it originally appeared to, but is on low birth weight babies. So these chemicals have been linked to, um, or by some studies and a review, have found that uh, the higher the, the, the PFAS level in a mother's blood, the lower birth weight for the baby. Normally on a scale of a few ounces, but once again, if you're the mother of a low birth weight baby who was under by an ounce or two, it may have had the impact. So once again, these are things that are still being studied, but I think that that really hits home that this isn't all Americans and it might be having an effect already at the current levels in blood on American health. Yeah, thank you, Kyle, for um, you know talking about those issues as well. That is really important. Um, all of us here this evening are particularly excited to be here having this conversation at DelVal. And you have some of the top ranked animal sciences and agricultural programs in the country. And Pennsylvania is known for its high quality dairy, produce, and livestock farms. The research on the effects that PFAS chemicals have on our crops, our livestock, and dairy and our other food sources is still in its infancy. So there's a lot of room uh, for you future farmers and scientists out there in the audience to get involved and become real leaders and problem solvers in this effort. For any of you who have seen The Devil We Know or Dark Waters, you will remember that it was a farmer, after all, Wilbur Tennant, who started this whole, um, this whole fight. What we do know is that PFAS chemicals seep into the groundwater in which we grow produce and other crops, the surface water in which fish live and from which many other animals drink, and they find their way into the biosolids, that manure that farmers use to nurture their crops. So here in Pennsylvania, representatives from the Department of Agriculture and the Fish and Boat Commission sit on the governor's PFAS action team. So it's really uh, great and beneficial to have those voices on that action team. Within our Department of Agriculture, the bureaus of Food Safety and Laboratory Services, Animal Health and Diagnostic Services, Farmland Preservation and the State Conservation Commission are all involved with PFAS efforts and monitor the latest PFAS science related to dairy milk, food supply, biosolids, livestock, preserved farmland, and laboratory testing, but they don't yet have the resources to establish their own labs and conduct their own tests, so we are working to fix that. Kyle, you um, talked a little bit uh, in the beginning about the effect on our agricultural system, but uh, I was wondering if you could talk about what you're seeing in other regions with respect to livestock and crops. 
Yeah, so um, in the national media, there's been two really compelling stories about this. I don't know if compelling is the right word. Tragic might be another word. But uh, there's a farmer in New Mexico whose farm was right near um, Canaan Air Force Base where the firefighting foams were used. And uh, to make a long story short, just like here in Pennsylvania, it got into the aquifer. Uh, the chemicals got into the aquifer. They came back up onto this farm. I believe that uh, I think the cows probably drank directly from that water. One way or another, they were exposed and that got into their milk. And it has essentially shuttered his dairy operation. Uh, it was reported in the media down in New Mexico that his uh, operation went from 20 million a year to zero uh, because of the presence of these chemicals. And New Mexico presents this really tough to catch-22 where it's one of the most active states trying to pursue solutions for their residents and their farmers. And New Mexico actually declared these substances or these uh, chemicals hazardous substances in an effort to get a legal tool to use against the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense is fighting against that, and there's been no resolution. The military, as uh, last time I checked on this storyline, had not agreed to do anything for this farm yet. Uh, but in declaring these hazardous substances, um, now you've got a farmer whose products are contaminated with <laughs> hazardous substances. I think even regardless, it would have been the same thing. Nobody wants to drink this with an unknown chemical in it. Uh, but that is an example of a very real-world impact on uh, on a uh, agriculture operation. Um, in Maine, you had a certain, slightly different but same result, where you had, I believe it was also uh, a dairy farm where this very similar issue happened. But what happened there was that the uh, land had been um, uh, used had been um, used sludges from wastewater treatment plants. So some people might be aware that a lot of uh, sludge from wastewater treatment plant operations after being uh, treated for, you know, most of the things that you would know to look for is then repurposed as fertilizer in agricultural operations. And if uh, PFAS isn't filtered out, it can go into the ground and into the crops. And uh, I believe that is what occurred in Maine. So you had two different situations where a location right next to a source of PFAS or just receiving product elsewhere contaminated uh, with PFAS. So, and um, I think that's a concern across a lot of different agricultural sectors is because this stuff is so pervasive in the environment and has not historically been looked for, um, nobody really knows uh, what to expect or how widespread the problem uh, is. Uh, and what I mentioned that too, this also poses a large issue for uh, municipalities who um, are, would be concerned that they would have liability uh, over things like their like their sludge and other, they're the ones who are at the end of this path for these chemicals often and, and have to deal with this. So it opens up um, an, another issue uh, there. Um, and on, specifically talking about agriculture as well, I, uh, in preparation for this, I reviewed, I, I saw a new review that I hadn't seen before, it came out last year, a review of literature, and uh, it concluded that um, PFOA, uh, low accumulations, have been found in peeled potatoes and cereal seeds, uh, while shorter chain compounds uh, can accumulate at high levels in leafy vegetables and fruits. Um, so there is certainly evidence that uh, these chemicals have an uptake into a variety of, of foods and crops. And um, to bring it back a little bit to our local uh, source and contamination here, uh, around the military bases through reviewing some of the files that I mentioned uh, Mr. Kuker uh, obtained earlier. Um, it's definitely aware that the military officials are aware that this whole cycle uh, perpetuates itself of into water, into sludges, into disposal of carbon filtration, and can end up back into the, uh, into the food supply. Uh, and that's one of the issues why I think remediation and cleanup of the environment is so important. Drinking water exposure out to shut that off is obviously of very high importance, but to understand the full cycle of how this works and start to um, uh, stop those exposure routes as well is potentially even greater challenge. Thank you so much for that. So we have talked uh, a lot about what we know, what's been done. I think most of us here can agree that it's certainly not enough. And we've only really scratched the surface. Uh, out in the lobby, there is a table that has a lot of the uh, literature that's been produced on this topic, including some of those reports and studies that we have referenced here today. But one of the things that I want to ask, and, and for all of the people here in the audience and those people that are watching at home, 
Uh, I want to ask what's next. Uh, what can we all be doing to address this crisis? And uh, Hope, I'll, I'll turn to you first. Any words of wisdom for our audience? So um, there are, I came up with three um, pretty important ways. One is to protect yourself and your families. Um, there aren't any laws with PFAS right now. Um, you can get your water tested and you can invest in a home filtration system due to the uncontained plumes that we know at going to the RAB meetings around the bases, it still remains a threat um, to our water source, the fact that these plumes exist and they are going into the local creeks. So testing is important. Um, if you have a private well, you need to get your water tested for PFAS. Um, the regular tests that you have your well water tested for does not include PFAS. Out in the front foyer, we have um, a couple sheets on where to get your water tested. Um, and PFAS is not regulated, again, in our drinking water. So please get your water tested. Um, another thing you can do is help with these health studies. We all need to participate and get involved with the Temple study and with the National Health Study. Uh, I think everyone would agree that we have the right to know what we were exposed to as a community, as well as what we can do about it. And these are things we can do about it. Buxmont Coalition is working with local researchers to bring health studies into our community. And we need to learn about the PFAS health effects and the third thing is politics. Um, the problem that we face today is there are not laws and there are no regulations for PFAS. So we encourage you to get involved in politics. Pressure your elected officials on this issue. Let them know it matters to you. And make sure you're registered to vote. Um, research before you vote on where candidates stand on the environmental issues. We have uh, also voter registrations out front. So these are some of the things you can do. And please vote. Thank you so much, Hope. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is happening at the legislative uh, level, but I also wanted to take the opportunity to introduce Wendy Ullman, who is the state representative that represents this area. And uh, any of you who live here in the area, she'll speak a little bit um, in terms of uh, what she has seen in the legislature as well. But Kyle, I wanted to turn to you if you could offer any words of wisdom to our audience uh, about what they can do or should do to get involved. Yeah, uh, so as a journalist, this is a tough question normally because uh, we're not supposed to take sides or advocate for certain things. But uh, I think what I'll say, one thing that I've learned through this process um, is how much lawmakers actually do respond to people. So I see a lot of young people in the crowd. Uh, I have friends uh, probably of, of a very similar age, and quite a few of them are apathetic. You know, politicians are just going to do what they're going to do. And uh, I have found that to not be true. Um, that uh, when uh, f phone lines are being flooded and email accounts are being flooded, um, there can be a reaction. Uh, not always, it might not be the only decision in, uh, only factor in the decision, uh, but it is there. So um, whatever position of anything that you want to advocate, I just do encourage you to reach out and to take those, um, and to take those steps. And uh, other than that, I'm assuming there's quite a few future scientists in the room. So as an environmental reporter who works with a lot of um, scientists and writes about those kinds of issues, I encourage you to be open to, to journalists as well, and maybe even uh, make the first step in reaching out. I mean, a lot of my best work and stories only comes off of people sharing their research with me, sharing what they know, and being willing to talk about that and kind of get out into the, uh, into the public sphere a little bit. So i um, assuming some of you continue to progress in, that, in those kinds of careers and fields. Uh, yeah, encourage you to call your friendly neighborhood journalist. Thank you, Kyle. And I'm just going to talk a little bit legislatively. I have uh, a few bills that I've introduced. One is Senate Bill 581. That would establish a maximum contaminant level. We talked a little bit about that of 10 parts per trillion for PFAS in our drinking water. 
that would be an interim level until the EPA or DEP sets a permanent MCL. And SB 582, which would reclassify these chemicals as hazardous substances under Pennsylvania's Hazardous Sites Cleanup Act. And Mark, I wanted to talk to you because I know um, this is an important step, not only to require more stringent monitor monitoring, but also to open up more funding and make it easier uh, for us to sue polluters. And I know that you uh, could offer some, some uh, information about that uh, strategy as well. Yeah, well, um the, um, contrary to what people may think, the Department of Defense is not above the law. It is not above the environmental law at any event. And the Department of Defense and the Navy and the Air Force that um, so um, indiscriminately polluted our drinking water for decades could be held to account under Pennsylvania's Hazardous Sites Cleanup Act. They could be required to pay for blood testing to anybody who should get blood testing, except for one little detail. Uh, PFAS is not on the hazardous substance list. All that needs to be done to hold them accountable, besides proving a case in court, is to have it listed as a hazardous substance. Either EPA has to list it, or the DEP has to list it. Uh, there's also a bill, I think, of the U.S. House of Representatives that's gonna pass that would accomplish that. Um, I'll go out on a limb and say if there's two people you should call, it would be Senator Toomey and Governor Wolf. Um, that bill will go to the Senate, where it is expected to be blocked by the Republican majority. Senator Toomey needs to know how people in his uh, state feel about that. And Governor Wolf needs to know that the state needs to step up and declare PFAS, PFOA, PFOS as hazardous substances. Thank you so much, Mark. And before we turn it over for uh, audience uh, questions, I did want to give Wendy an opportunity, Representative Ullman an opportunity to introduce herself to all of you and uh, just briefly, uh, you know, give us your background with uh, PFAS and, and what it means to, to you to be working in the legislature on this issue. Well, we have, we have worked in the State House and we did pass that bill, the Todd Stevens bill, which was good legislation, a good remedy, it's a good start, but I really feel, and I think that Maria will back me up on this, we are seeing the beginning of a crisis which will be not, not just in this area. As we go into the testing, we will find that it's in more and more places. There have been wells within Doylestown town, Township that had been closed in years past. PFAS and the PFO are, are particular concerns. I have a bill which is being introduced in several different states, it's all sort of cloned, to identify any known carcinogen and to have a safe maximum level decreed so that all of the states that adopt this bill will have a safety level to give some teeth to legislation, and I know that your bill has that. But some of these other bills, uh, the Todd Stevens bill, does not have any identified state maximum level. Without all the pieces in place, we're not offering the protections that we really need to. And then just one thing which I don't have a legislative piece for right now, but it's a concern in my district and in many districts, in this district, which goes all the way to the Northampton County line, 60% of the people get their water from private wells. That's another very complex issue for testing, and there's no reason to think that there aren't many different areas with the same concerns. Testing for PFAS and for PFOA is incredibly expensive. It is something that municipalities can do, but for individual property owners, it's essentially prohibitive unless there's some way that we can, in a governmental initiative, support this incredibly important testing because I don't think any of us should take for granted the safety of our water, especially those of us who are using private wells. So I would just like to hear some more of your remarks, but that's, that's a piece of this, of this problem that needs to be addressed. Thank you so much, Representative. So I think we're going to turn it over now to uh, the audience for questions that you have. Uh, I do have some staff members here with microphones that they will be circulating, and they will be happy to 
uh, uh, allow you to ask your questions. Uh, we are going to give priority to students just to make sure that the students that are here this evening do have an opportunity to ask the questions that they have. But please put your hand up and we'll get right to you. Um, so you said that Doylestown wells were starting to show trace amounts. If this chemical were to be put on a hazardous uh, chemical list, would you require this to be testing for all of Pennsylvania or just areas you think that could be contaminated? Those wells were identified and have been closed. Uh, the the municipality has been very vigilant. Those, those wells are no longer in use. Um, I, I think we need to take the, the, the easy bits first. At, at, at some point, we should require all municipal wells to have that piece of testing in place. I, I suspect that this is going to be a, a problem that we'll find in many, many different locations. Right now, I think we're taking that it's like that, that the analogy of eating the, the elephant one bite at a time. But uh, that's an important question. Um, I was just wondering where and how I can get my blood drawn to get tested for it. Because I think it's a big problem in our community and I would like to be a person to see if it's in high levels in our bodies. So if you are in the affected area out front, there's a sign-up sheet that says the um, national health or blood draw. There's a sheet out front. Um, if you put your name and your information down, when we get information on when it's going to happen, we're happy to shoot you an email. Um, there's going to be a total of 1,000 adults and 200 children that will be blood tested. Um, we're not sure of the date of that yet, though. And just to comment on the Doylestown issue, I was at that DEP meeting um, with the Doylestown um, issue at Cross Keys. There was apparently eight homes that had private water that, were, that are being fixed right now. Um, but again, there is an issue because there were certain people on either end of that street that didn't get a call or if they didn't get a call, you know, maybe it got lost in the mail. So there's going to continue to be an issue with private wells. And that's why I'm suggesting that if you have a private well and you're anywhere near Warminster, Horsham, Warwick, you need your water tested for PFAS. And it's a, about $300 now. The, the price has dropped. Analytics in Telford does it. So be conscious of that. Um, for your family's health. Before we open it up, any other students have questions? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first one, what are the possible action plans that you have for um, the environmental cleanup for the chemical? Uh, well, uh, and the you. second question is, what about um, going after, uh, like, legally the company that was selling it to the military, too? Because I feel like they should be held responsible, too, because they were producing it. Oh, okay. I'll, okay, I'll take the second one first. Um, there have been lawsuits filed against DuPont 3M and the phone manufacturers. Um, it is a difficult case. Um, and it's basically they've all been centralized in front of a federal judge in South Carolina. The reason it is a challenging case is because they made the stuff for the U.S. government and they're going to say the government knew everything and okayed it. Now that's, that is not a black and white situation. That's pretty ambiguous and I could go at length about the different sides of that coin, but um, um, they're absolutely going to say that, and uh, the Navy loved, frankly, the Navy loved this stuff. Um, um, so the other question, in terms of the cleanup, I would defer to Kyle on that, since he is an expert on 
super fun law. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure, well, actually, just to quickly on the liability thing as well, and Mark, you can correct me if I have my wires mixed up here, but uh, I believe a number of state attorney generals have also filed suit against some of the chemical companies that made it. The one that stands out in my mind was Minnesota. Um, they, I think it was close to a billion dollars. Yeah, that's because they, they sued them as a polluter. They sued them as a polluter. Um, the, the manufacturing plant dumped the stuff. Uh, they did not sue them as a manufacturer of a product for the U.S. Department of Defense. Okay, so, so different there. They were able to win a nice pretty verdict, but that doesn't sound like it might be the, the case here. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the cleanup uh, action plan. I mean, I think that's most of my reporting uh, in 2019 was focused on what the Department of Defense is or is not doing for, for cleaning up environmentally. So I think to, to summarize as best as possible right now, if you ask them what's the plan, they're saying we're, we're studying. We're studying how far this stuff goes. We're studying how best to dispose of it or get rid of it, destroy it. Uh, we're doing all this work so at some point we can very efficiently do it how long length of time, how much they're going to clean it, to what standard, all very open questions. And that's led to a lot of um, concern, obviously, from communities uh, about what the plan is. They have taken some smaller steps, uh, installing small filtration systems, uh, maybe trying to stop really obvious places of flowing into something like Park Creek or the Neshaminy. Uh, but it's it's uh, very it doesn't do much on the overall overall picture, so I think that's why the legislation um, that Senator uh, Collette uh, and others have been promoting or pushing is the idea of if they can get these standards in place, it might give more tools, legal tools, to pursue and force cleanup, uh, force the cleanup to happen sooner and more robustly. And I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, and, and the, one of the other problems that we have when we talk about environmental cleanup, of course, is that, um, as has been mentioned over and over up here, that we don't have any standards. That health advisory limit is for drinking water, so we don't have standards yet for groundwater or for soil, um, and that's part of the problem as well. You'll, you know, we know what happens when you know our contaminated soil has water runoff that goes into our streams and our waterways. Uh, the plume of contaminated water migrates. It doesn't stop at the borders of Warrington, Warminster, and Horsham. It moves. And so we have to be really mindful as we talk about environmental cleanup and even drinking water contamination cleanup that we are including all of these areas that are not isolated to just the surrounding communities of that military base. Um, you know, um, I think that Hope was talking earlier about the, the RAB meetings, and at one of them we discussed whether or not um, a section of soil that had been um, dug up, whether it was going to be going to a certified landfill that could accept this contaminated soil. There was one identified in New Jersey. They declined to take that soil, so it currently sits uh, still at the base, uh, awaiting a, a location for that soil to be taken to. So. That's part of our problem too. No one wants to take the contaminated soil that we have here into their uh, communities. And we haven't yet figured out a way to clean that soil to make sure that we don't have further runoff into our streams and waterways that just continue to um, exacerbate the contamination that already exists. So I think that the governor is, um, I, I do believe that he has a focus on this issue. I know. Uh, I mean, he, every time he sees me, he knows I'm going to just talk to him about PFAS in the water. So he's hearing it from me. He's hearing it from a lot of people. We passed uh, two bills in our legislature this past session that dealt with PFAS, um, which is really important because it's something that uh, we haven't acted on legislatively prior. So that's a step in the right direction. It's not enough. It's not um, going to fix the problem, but at least we're on the governor's radar and we're on our DEP's radar and they are working and our Department of Health is really invested in making sure that the um, contamination to individuals doesn't persist. So we are at least working in the right directions when we have good people uh, like the ones on this panel that are talking about these issues and raising the alarm and we have good people like yourselves that are coming to a forum like this to learn more about this contamination 
education, then we can only all benefit from that knowledge. And so while I wish there were a better answer for what the environmental cleanup action plan in the Commonwealth is, um, what I can tell you is that we are at least talking about this and moving in the direction of um, identifying the resources we need to make sure that our, our communities aren't contaminated. Hi, my name's Tim Berger. I'm, uh, I do environmental work and I live in the community here. But I wanted to make a pitch first about the uh, old unfunded mandate argument that's been tying up some of the PFAS legislation. Uh, it's actually a, f a fallacious argument because the unfunded mandate is not making these substances hazardous substances because the authorities that have to spend money to clean them up now, the companies that do, cannot use the available statutes to recover the cost of doing that. So it is a reverse unfunded mandate. The, the cost is being borne by the municipal authorities in this area to clean this up, short of actually suing the Navy, <clears throat> or as we did in Warminster and Warrington, getting the EPA to issue them a Safe Drinking Water Act order that directed them to replace the water supplies there. So the unfunded mandate argument is just completely untrue. The unfunded mandate is actually not passing legislation. I drafted legislation to make them hazardous substances, which was distributed to all of our local representatives probably four years ago. And I'm not sure where it's gone, but I understand that was the argument. The second point is, is there actually is <coughs> cleanup standards under Pennsylvania law. Under Act II, uh, the, the HAL that was created, the health advisory level for two contaminants, PFOA and P PFOA and PFOS, is actually incorporated by reference into Act II as a groundwater standard. And from that, there is a mechanism to actually calculate soil standards. The problem is 70 isn't the number that most states are settling on. And so we may have a standard, but it may not be the right standard. So discharging water at 70 for only two of those compounds is not necessarily the right standard. And so it's important to get the right standard in place that backs and matches the science that's being viewed by some of the other states, which are setting levels as low as 10 instead of 70 for combined just two of the PFAS compounds. And we haven't even talked about Gen X compounds, which are the other ones. I, I would echo that statement by my fellow member of the bar, uh, that if we could simply list it as a hazardous substance under Hazardous Sites Cleanup Act, we could hold the military accountable and create the funding that would enable the municipalities to deal with the problem and other polluters as well, hold them accountable. So I just want to know, have there been any restrictions placed on companies that produce products like Scotchgard and Gore-Tex? Because you would think inevitably the wastewater from producing those products would still contain these chemicals. Have there been any restrictions to kind of limit that in terms of production? I, you know, you, you hit an interesting nerve with Gore-Tex. Um, that, that company uh, grew out of DuPont. Um, was actually founded by a uh, a uh, old Duponter, and um, they got all their stuff from Dupont for years. So to answer your question, I'm not aware of anything that they're doing. I don't know what they're doing. I think they're a pretty high tech, proactive company, but um, I have no idea whether they're doing it. There's no question that companies like that would have in all likelihood emitted PFOA into the atmosphere and it would have spread up for miles. Um, in the most general terms, I think what we've seen a lot with companies that have used these products traditionally is that they now use shorter chain varieties of the chemicals. So once again, you're talking about the carbon backbone, the longer generally believed to be the more persistent and more toxic, although that's needs examination. So I've seen a fair amount of reporting from across the country of communities uh, where now they're seeing massive releases of some of these new varieties and uh, people are wondering if we're starting the whole thing over again to some extent. So that's one of the areas uh, they're looking at. And I believe there was a whole bunch of stuff that almost made it through Congress this past, uh, this past year that ended up getting nixed. Uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there were a, a few things that actually made it through 
One of them was adding uh, PFAS substances to the toxic release inventory. Mark, thank you for shaking your head. I was I, I was trading out onto uncertain ground there. So, uh, and what that is is that's a national. Yeah, I believe that either either that or EPA announced they're going to do it. One of those two. It's it's a national database that um, basically tracks emissions from factories into the land, air, and water, and uh, it's only certain substances are on there. So being added, I think, will be a tool where communities will be able to start knowing if this stuff is going into the environment uh, uh, near them. I don't know how long of a list of the chemicals or the specifics, but I think there is some progress that way. So um, thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, my question is about consumer products. Is there any consumer product, any category, whether it's bottled water, foodstuffs, um, items that are packaged in plastic, where there are any products that are identified as being more safe than others, any items that are PFAS free or, or have been tested or are certifying or at least being marketed as being safer than, than the competition? So I'm just going to recommend e the Environmental Working Group, EWG.org, that you all go on that site because they, um, they can show you pizza boxes, makeup, furniture, clothing. They, if you type PFAS in there and products, it'll, that, that's probably the biggest network and best source. That's where I go. And that's where I send my kids to look at what they're eating and what they're putting on their bodies, lotions, different things like that. I'm interested in um, the idea that we're uh, removing this soil to put it somewhere else. So aren't we just making the problem bigger doing that? I mean, we're, we're passing our problem on to somebody else to poison them and their children? So it's a good question. I don't think I was clear when I talked about the removal of that soil. Uh, these um, soils would go to uh, landfill sites that have been designated to collect uh, certain contaminated soils, and they have standards that are set in place to make sure that they have uh, concrete or, or some kind of lining that goes a certain level deep to make sure that there is no seepage from the soil that they're collecting and putting into their landfill. That's why these landfills that are designated to collect these hazardous substances are so few and far between and why there is an application process and why they have really the authority to say, no, we're not taking your contaminated soil because uh, they you know, only take a certain amount of contaminated um, uh, substances uh, from various places all around the country. So uh, we're not. We're not putting um, contaminated soil into a regular landfill where the runoff is going to contaminate, uh, you know, other people's drinking water. But it's a good question, and I'm sorry I wasn't clear in my response. And one of the big problems is the end of life with these chemicals because they are so durable and they don't break down. I don't think anybody has a sense of how long it really takes. Um, so you've got two options. You can go store them somewhere, like a landfill, and, and, and hopefully it's got the, the proper lining and that holds over time. And, uh, but uh, the other option is to try and destroy it in some way. And I know that a colleague and I, this is one of the last things we were chasing down before I transitioned to my new role, was about the effectiveness of incineration. So. Um, I think uh, there's, that's been, that seems to be the, the understanding of the best possible method is to try and incinerate at very high temperatures. There's two issues. Uh, one is I'm not sure that there's, actually I know for sure there isn't, hasn't been conclusive research on that. Um, are you just shipping it somewhere to have it incinerated and emitted out into the air through the stack? And a lot of times those facilities are in lower income communities, so you run into environmental justice issues. Um, and as well, uh, also, we, we realized that uh, our, there seemed to be a lot of things going on behind the scenes, but what from WeWork could see, there was some legal wrangling between the waste industry and uh, a regular like the Pennsylvania DEP of even whether or not they have to do anything special or declare it because it's not listed as a hazardous substance. So I think that leaves open the door where we have a real lack of information even potentially about where it's being incinerated, to what extent, and to what uh, success. 
And I just wanna, wanted to add um, to the earlier question about products and uh, what we're doing to you know, monitor these products. Because of the uh, conversation around P, PFAS chemicals, uh, some um, companies are actually starting to designate if they have products that are PFAS, PFOA free. Popcorn bags, for example, you can find popcorn with a label on it that says that this popcorn bag does not have um, PFAS or PFOA. Some of our plastic products um, you can find uh, that will also indicate that as well on the packaging. So again, that just reinforces why it's so important to continue these conversations because the more pressure we put on uh, manufacturers that uh, we don't want these products with um, these chemicals in our homes, the, the more they are forced to find alternatives and to also let us know, hey, our product is safe for you to purchase and bring into your home, uh, which hopefully drives uh, uh, us as consumers to purchase those products over others. Senator, we have time for one more quick question. I was a victim of heavy metal toxicity for over 25 years because of the fillings in my mouth, and I finally had them taken out in 93 and 94. Subsequently, this summer, I was tested again and had residues in my body for which I had oral chelation done over a period of three months through an alternative doctor. Would you recommend the BioCleanse treatment where I uh, have my feet in water to remove toxins? Would they have the same effect as it would on these chemicals that are in the water? And the second part, I was told that at the church where I attended the Buxman Unitarian, uh, an official came and told the minister, the water is perfectly safe in the Little Nishamani. I don't believe what he was told is true. I'd like to hear comments from you. So I, I actually had a client who, again, I don't, no one here wants to give medical advice, but I did have a client with uh, PFAS in the blood who asked for advice about chelation and uh, the doctor said, no, there's no, no indication that chelation would work or that it would be effective. So that, just passing that along for whatever that's worth. The Little Nishamani Creek, depending on where you sample, could have a high level of PFAS in it, depending on where you take the sample. Um, yeah, ever post the aqua results? Yeah, um, do you have it on your? I think at the BucksmontWater.org website, there may be uh, a little map showing you where the high levels hit the Little Nishamani Creek. And on the waterways, so that's something that, that uh, we've looked at those maps as well before. And, um, and uh, I think Park Creek is the main water body coming off of um, the Willow Grove Station that runs into Little Nishamani. And if my memory serves correctly, again, 70 parts per trillion is the drinking water advisory. Uh, you were upwards of a thousand parts per trillion in Park Creek, significantly downstream. And I know the, the one thing that, um, so yeah, Aqua Pennsylvania did a lot of environmental testing. They have a treatment plant along the main Neshaminy, which I believe is about 21 river miles away from the base. And levels there reached as high as 67 parts per trillion in the past. So um, I think there's some debate about exactly how much of that is from the bases versus other environmental sources. But uh, I know they feel pretty strongly that Aqua does, that the pollution reached um, that far down. Now, uh, I don't think most people are going down to the Little Neshaminy Creek and dr drinking directly out of it. I would recommend uh, against that. Uh, so in terms of what that means, I, I think I've heard for the most part that swimming, incidental ingestion, dermal absorption, not necessarily a concern. I'm not sure how many people swim in the Little, little Neshaminy anyway. I think one of the, the bigger concerns, and that's, again, one of the things we were hitting on, was what the potential fish accumulation would be. And if people are catching fish out of that waterway, how big of a concern uh, that would be. Well, please join me in thanking our panel tonight. This has been a great start to our Spring One Health Seminar Series. For those of you who uh, may not be receiving emails from us already about our seminar series, if you would like to add your email address to our list, please do come up and do that. We also have a list of our upcoming One Health. Our next one is going to be on the 26th of February, and this is going to be meeting the challenge of an interconnected 13,500 square mile basin of water, which is 
Delaware River Basin. So ought to be a nice follow-up to this. Uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for coming tonight.